Welcome, Irish fans, to this week's edition of the Jack Swarbrick Show. On today's show, we will visit with fascinating Notre Dame punter Tyler Newsom, the first football walk-on to be named the captain in Notre Dame history, Austin Webster, and Notre Dame director of football recruiting, Aaron Carney. As you know, James Onwalu did his final show last week. He takes his final, final exams this week, will graduate from the Mendoza College of Business, and begin training for the next step in his football career. Notre Dame softball pitching ace Rachel Naslin will return to our show next semester, but she is not available this week, so that means Jack and I will get things started. And Jack, there are certainly lots of things to talk about. It's a busy week for all the student athletes uh, because of exams, and certainly uh, those are important everywhere. Maybe more important here with the two-semester rule, you have got to get it done to a 2.0 level every single semester if you want to keep playing. Yeah, that's right, and, and, and having a higher standard than the NCAA standard relative to GPA uh, uh, makes it important. But, um, you know, uh, historically our, the young people here have done a great job, and uh, I'm glad you gave credit to James for taking finals, but I don't think he had any. I, he didn't I, have I, any? I don't think he I had any. I thought he any. told me he had one. He really? said he had to, he mentioned he had to take finals. And it was final packing, I think, or, or something. Or maybe he final was, papers. Yeah, I don't, maybe. Okay. He maybe. told you're, me he you're, did. You're giving James right. a lot of credit. Well, um, he used that as a ruse not to do the show this week. <laughs> he's gone. He's, uh, he's, All right. uh, All right. he's, he didn't go somewhere warmer though. I think he's home in Minneapolis for the time being. Lots of action. Uh, the, the athletes get uh, this week off, but the two weekends are usually busy. And, in fact, uh, we taped our last show before the Notre Dame women's team, ranked one and two, depending on the poll you were taking a look at, took on the UConn team, ranked one and two, depending on the poll you were looking at. Uh, and ultimately, though, great crowd, great atmosphere. And I know Muffet was very clear, and, and it was obvious, a very good Notre Dame team did not play as well as it's capable of. Yeah, I was... Uh... I was watching that from uh, New York City. I wish I, I uh, could have been here, but uh, football week in New York City took me there. Um, and it was fun to, to, to sort of watch the atmosphere, get a sense of it, the great television coverage of the game. And, you know, at half, I felt really good about where we were. We had gotten down. We started slow. Great second mm -hmm. quarter. Um, go into the half in, in really good shape. And, um, but we just hit a flat spell. And, uh, you know, they're, they're UConn. They're, they're, they're a tough team, tough. They're very athletic. Uh, we had some matchup issues, I think. But I still came away from that game and, and the follow-up game, you know, feeling every bit as optimistic about this team as I have since the start. Well, I mean, it's a tough game to lose. And uh, I wasn't at practice, but I'm sure Muffet made it very clear that they had to return to a level of play that they know they're capable of. And they had a tough game at DePaul. That is a very difficult gym to play in. DePaul is ranked. They're always up for Notre Dame. And Notre Dame played very well Saturday night getting that victory. Yeah, DePaul's gotten itself in a position where whether here or there, they're a tough matchup. They they are as proficient at the three-point shot as anybody in the country, statistically so. And and they define the arc very very broadly. They're, they'd be good from, from NBA range. And so it takes a, a different preparation. And uh, I thought we played really well in that game. We got off to a great start. Um, they came back third third quarter. It got very close, but boy, we closed the game out effectively, and mainly on the defensive end. I thought Michael Johnson gave us great energy uh, defensively. Our, our bigs were in foul trouble, but you know Brianna could stay on the floor at the end, and 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 we really won that game on the defensive end. Of course, for the men's team, undefeated at nine and zero, took on undefeated Villanova nine and zero in Newark, New Jersey, but. Uh, I called the game. It was a road game. Uh, everybody in Philly looked like they got on the train and got in their cars and came up there. But uh, I think Notre Dame sent a message to, to the country. They came out. They dominated most of the first half and, and played very well till the stretch when Villanova really stepped up and made some plays. Yeah, it, you know, it's, um, it's the nature of sport. But, you know, in that case, a great player took over the game. Um, I thought we played so well, so we were so well prepared, and we executed so effectively. Um, and you could tell our guys never had a doubt. I mean, they were they couldn't have been more confident. But but a pretty special college basketball player decided he was going to take over the game towards the end there, and boy, did he. Well, Josh Hart is considered by many, even before that game, to be a legitimate national player of the year candidate. And he had far and away uh, the best scoring game of his career. His previous high was 31. He had 37. But Notre Dame did everything they could to defend him. And this is one of Notre Dame's best defensive teams ever since I got here back in 82. And even putting the best defenders on him, 
he just was able to make plays. They just couldn't stop him at the end. Yeah, no, and that's what a great player does, and, and, and he did it. I took so much positive out of that game. As you point out, tough environment, right? I was glad Mike kept saying on TV it was a road game in case the bas- men's basketball committee was not paying attention, Forgetting that, yeah. thinking it was a neutral, neutral court game. Um, but I thought that was great. And, you know, um, two guys who've been carrying us all year, VJ and Bondi, didn't have their best games. And, and to have those guys not play at their very best and still be where we were in that game and really control the first half completely – um, I, I, boy, that, that says great things. And it was reflected in the polls. I mean, how often do you lose a game and go up in the polls? Went up a couple slots in the AP and one in the coaches. Yeah, and we should have. I mean, mm-hmm. It's absolutely appropriate. And, and, and so um, I think that's great. Now we have a completely different test uh, this Saturday in the Crossroads Classic, one of my favorite events of the year. If, if, if you haven't been to it for our audience, you know, we're either playing uh, um, Purdue or Indiana and Butler's playing the other in a doubleheader. And the arena is just electric. It's just charged. Uh, it's such a great basketball atmosphere, good, great Indiana basketball atmosphere. Um, but, but, man, that's a different challenge because you talk about bigs, um, Swanigan and Haas, and, and, and I, don't know, I don't know how big Haas is, but he is enormous. And uh, they're going to present a different challenge for us than Villanova did. Oh, absolutely. Not only are they very good inside, but they're one of the better three-point shooting teams in the country. And they certainly, the veterans on that team, and Haas is one of them, has not forgotten the last time Notre yeah. Dame played them two years ago down there. But you are right. I hope Irish fans come out. I know the alumni club is uh, having a, a little meeting in the arena, the monogram club's meeting down there. Uh, it is great atmosphere for basketball, and it would be nice to see at least a couple of sections uh, filled with blue and gold because, you know, Purdue will travel. IU is going to be all over the building. Butler will be there. It'll be interesting to see uh, who the IU and Butler fans root for. It's tough for IU because it's no, hard for them to for root Purdue. for Purdue. They're so. never, they're never so. rooting for They may be silent, but they're not well, going to root I for Purdue. I want them Purdue. to come early and root, and, you know, yeah. root for the, the Irish because they, they're the second game. The second half of our game, the yes. place will be packed and it'll be rocking. Um, um, so, so you know, again, it's a great, it's a great basketball atmosphere. I hope people who are in the vicinity, we probably can't get a ticket now, but if you can, come out, come out and see it. Um, and and it's going to be a great next challenge for us. Right. This is a, this is a team that they could win the Big Ten title, and uh, it'll be a good measuring stick for right. us. Notre Dame's been having great success against Big Ten teams. What I like the most coming back from that trip with the team, and when you play that well, and I said it on the air, you have nothing to be ashamed about. The team was ticked off. They were mad at themselves because they really believed deep down that they should have won, and they didn't want to hear any of this, you played really well. They thought, no, we played well enough to win, and we blew it. And Villanova won the game, but I like that attitude. And they'll start really hitting the practice floor again beginning a little bit Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They'll have a couple days, and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, that's where the program is. I mean, you go to, you go to consecutive Elite Eights. Only team in the country. Yeah, and the first of those, you're a shot away from going to the Final Four. Um, you, you know, it's um, it's where this program is. They don't expect to lose to anybody, and that's a that, that's a great culture to have. Hockey team once again ranked this season, and they came up. It's always great to win at Boston College. Yeah, I, I think we're going to look back on that game as very significant as the year goes on. Uh, first of all, it leads into a, lar- a significant break in college hockey. Um, it's the nature of the hockey season. They, it's very long, but they take a significant break this time of year. So to have momentum going into that break was so important. But, but BC's a measuring stick for college hockey, not just for us. But, I mean, they are consistently a contender for the Final Four, Frozen Four, excuse me. And... Uh, Boy, was that a great game. I mean, you know, for them to – BC to get up 2 nothing, and then us to have that second period where three goals, Andrews Bjork continues to just be game in and game out, show why he's one of the best players in college hockey. I, I think he's le- – I know he's leading the conference in scoring, maybe leading the country in scoring right now. And uh, it, was, it was such a well-played hockey game. We got that lead, and then we kept we kept the pressure on. In the third period, where BC is obviously trying to tie the game, we we had the better of the action, and I thought that was so great. And then at the very end of the game, inside a minute, um, Cal makes a just an unbelievable stop uh, with, with his with his blocking glove. He, he caught it with his with his blocking side, which doesn't happen, his stick side, um, and 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 prevented just a point blank goal right on the doorstep and 
you know, that's what has to happen. All, all phases of the game came together to deliver a huge victory. Anders Bjork was named the Hockey East Coast Player of the Week. We should mention Brianna Turner, named the ACC Women's Basketball Player of the Week. And, of course, you had the Echoes Award Show, the end-of-season banquet. Uh, and to make it clear, the purpose of this, if you have a great season, it's to celebrate the great season. It wasn't necessarily celebrating a 4-8 and eight season, but it was saluting your graduating seniors and grad students for all that they've contributed uh, to the program. And it went very well. Yeah, I thought, I thought the tone was perfect. Um, you, you know, you you don't want to go into an event like that and, and pretend you didn't have a rough season. And I thought the way Coach acknowledged that at the outset but but but, but talked about that's not going to change the way we approach tonight because we owe it to the seniors. They've given so much to the program. They have left a very strong foundation for us to build off of. And so it, it would have been a shame not to celebrate them and celebrate them in the way that event has become. For people who haven't watched it or haven't attended – we have a lot of fun. It's as much roast as it is uh, tribute, um, and we have we we we, we just it, it reflects sort of the camaraderie and the fun of the program, and uh, nobody was spared. Um, we we made some good fun of Coach Kelly dancing as if he were dancing uh, and speaking to the team before the game, and uh, it, it was it's emblematic of the fun we have at that event while while recognizing some great young men. And if people want to see it, if I remember correctly, it's on NBC Sports, and that's Saturday at noon. It's Televised locally on WNDU, 7.30 Saturday. Those are the times I remember originally. And seven captains were named at the event, including Deshaun Kaiser. He had not yet made his decision on Saturday. But I think some people wondered, why did you do that? I think you didn't know what he was going to do for sure. But he certainly, with his leadership this year, earned the right to be the captain next year. And I thought it was a nice touch to say, you know, if you come back, you're going to be a captain. And even if you're not, you led so well. I mean, not only the MVP, there's MVP's most valuable player, and there's also someone who led enough to be that kind of a leader the next year. I thought it was a nice touch. Yeah, I, I, I liked everything about the captains that were named. I think it's a great group. Who I like that we named them early to give them a chance to really put their stamp on the culture and help lead. I agree completely on the decision regarding Deshaun. I was involved in it, in, in, in that decision and in the discussion. And for all the reasons you say, it was as long as he was still a member of our team, and at that moment he was, um, notwithstanding the likelihood that he was leaving, it was absolutely appropriate to name him as captain. And I don't think anyone can question his decision. You never like to see a great player leave. You'd like to see him come back and play again. I know I spent a practice with an NFL scout uh, that I know a little bit, and they're not supposed to comment on players, so I won't out him. But NFL scouts just love Deshaun for everything he brings to the table, his smarts, and he really does have an NFL-caliber arm, specifically with the ability to put the ball where it needs to be all over the field. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think, you know, there's – there's a fair amount of uh, debate among people who don't know much about it, talking pros and cons. But um, he'll have great success because he has all the, the, the makeup. He's got the physical makeup. He's got the emotional makeup. He's got the intellect, intellect to, to play really well. So he'll, he'll be a huge success. But it's also a really good year to come out as yeah, a quarterback. And, and, and that's a, that's, that may be that's, even the bigger factor. It's part of the deliberations, yes. right? You've got a lot of teams with a need, and you've got a pretty shallow pool. And so you have to factor that in. And I was fully supportive. Deshaun consulted with all of us. He, he was very thorough in his discussion. His parents were involved. It was, a great, it was a great exploration of the options. And he came to a decision that was right for him. And we fully support him. When we come back, we will visit with a man who has the ability to flip the field during a football game. Very successful Notre Dame Hunter Tyler Newsom on the Jacks Warriors. 